morning. I'm going to check that the video is working because I can't see the light. Okay, we're on. I only do that because last week preached the world's greatest sermon ever preached and none of the audio was recorded. <laughs> so I decided to take down the video so you wouldn't just see me talking into silence. It was, we could have made it like uh, those silent movies. That would have been fun. But apparently, we've got really good technology now to where if the light's not on, it literally will not pick up a word you say. I mean, you couldn't hear anything. It was so funny. It was awesome. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to First Thessalonians. So we'll do some announcements real quick. And I know everybody wants me to be quick because it's 83 degrees in here. But we're also going to, of course, spend time with God this morning. And if it's a little warm, it's okay. But we'll get into the word. But a quick few announcements. One, VBS this Friday. It is our prayer and our hope and our desire to have plenty of kids and air conditioning working. So we'll do what we can on that for both before VBS this Friday. And the second announcement, Wednesday we're having German food. We're doing a whole German um, missions focus at 6.30 Wednesday night. So we'll hopefully have AC then too, but if we don't, then we'll maybe do it outside or do it downstairs. But either way, we're going to have German food and we'll have it kind of quick. Uh, another announcement, the Sunday school luncheon, the adult luncheon was moved to next month. So next month there will be a Sunday luncheon, a Sunday school luncheon. It should be on a Tuesday and I believe everyone's going to a restaurant on Harrison Bay. If you're joining with us through YouTube. Good morning. Hello. It's great to see you. You'll notice that, that we're all kind of waving because it's a little hot in here. So now was a great day to be at home in your own air conditioning. But we miss you and we hope to see you soon here in person. We're in 1 Thessalonians. We've been doing a study on kind of what a Christian looks like. What, what does it mean to have faith? What does it mean to be a believer? What are the actions? What do we look like if you're, if you're not... If you're just kind of watching churchy people, what's your opinion of them? What do they look like? That's what we've been going through. And we're kind of going through what, is, what are we supposed to look like? And if I could say anything of what a Christian looks like, it better be love. They better love others. They better love others well. We're supposed to. It's not that we're perfect in it. It's not that there's an expectation of you to be perfect in it. But our heart's desire should be to find ways to love others. On love, we know that of the fruit of the Spirit, one of the first ones, the first one, is love. And it was written one time that love is the key when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is just love singing. Peace is love when it's resting. Long-suffering is love when it's enduring. Kindness is love's touch. Goodness, well, that would be love's character. Faithfulness is love's habit. Gentleness is love's self-forgetfulness. And self-control is when love is holding the reins. Everything hinges on love. And as believers, we should be love in action. We should be love in word. We should be love in motion. And so as we're looking at what Paul is going to say in chapter 2 to, to how he engaged with this church in Thessalonians is how he engaged with these people. We're going to see his motivation, his purpose, his focus, his desire, his heart in this. And this should also give us an idea of how we should engage our friends, our family, our neighbors, our streets behind us, the homes around us, how we should engage the world for Christ. So before we get into that, let me ask you, New Hope, whether in person today with our little fans waving because it's hot or whether at home watching or whether you're somewhat engaged with us watching. I want to ask this question. It's twofold. Number one, who do we want to attract to New Hope? And then number two, which I think is much more important, why, oh, why do we want to, to attract these individuals? Who are we trying to engage and why are we trying to engage them? I'd like to say we need to be known for something as a church, right? 
we need to be known for something as a church. Where are our talents? Where is our mission? Where is our passion? Where is our heart's desire? What is our vision? What is our focus? We should be known for something. And I think a part of what that needs to be is what God has blessed us with, which is our experience in life. And we'll get more into that in a moment. But if you've got Thessalonians chapter 2 handy, begin reading with me. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by the way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. So beginning right there, Paul is kind of giving us a reason for and he's stating, just as you guys know, we didn't come to you for our own purposes. We're not going out there trying to love our neighbors for our own purpose, trying to love our friends and family for our own purpose. We're not trying to put the wool over your eyes, if you will. We're not trying to lie to you, to fool you, to control you, to deceive you. We're not trying all of these type of things. I'm not trying my best to convince you to come to New Hope out of a desire to put a big list of rules and regulations and make you follow all these things. It's not about our handbook or our manual or any of that. He's saying, I'm not trying to get rich. I'm not trying to, to have a powerful following. I'm not trying for any of that stuff. We didn't come for any of that. Our heart's desire is to free you from sin, to free you from legalism, to free you from the chains that that religious, all this stuff throws on you, our heart's desire is to introduce you to Jesus Christ. And on a sad trail here, did you know, if you've spent much time reading the Gospels, you'll see 13 different times, well, 10 different times with Christ, but 13 times totally, something called tradition is brought up. 13 different times tradition. Matter of fact, the main thing the Pharisees kept going to Jesus on was that you and your followers are not adhering to tradition. You're not following tradition. And the reason why they were so focused on that is they wrote most of it. For hundreds of years, they had created all this new tradition. And before we get too hard on the Pharisees, let's take a look that for a hundred years, we've created traditions, not just the Nazarenes, but the Baptists and the Methodists and the Episcopalians and the Catholics, and the Church of God, and the Pentecostals, and the First Assemblies. You pick whichever denomination you want to. They've created a handbook. They've got a manual. They've got some traditions. And they've started, in essence, legalizing the traditions as if that is the Word of God. And before we let our non-denominational brothers and sisters off the hook, they do this as well. They really do. They'll have a core set of tenets that they go by, which is the truth, which is the gospel. But then there's this thing called tribal knowledge. And you begin to develop your own little thing. We love to create our own rules. And it's out of a desire to help people. And Paul is stating right here, we did not come to you trying to throw you under our rules, trying to set ourselves up as the authority so that you will give us money and you will follow us and we will have power and all of this stuff. But we came to you instead with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thirteen times tradition is mentioned in the New Testament. Ten of them negative. Only three was positive, and the only three that the tradition that was positive was look at the lives of the apostles and do what they're doing. Follow what they are doing. It was get to the true base heart of the gospel, which is simply this. You can't save yourself. Jesus saved you. Now go love people and love God. Heart of the gospel. What are the rules we're supposed to follow? Love each other love God. Quit trying to make yourself righteous. It won't work. Follow Jesus Christ. He paid the price so you will be righteous. And now stop sinning. That's the other part Paul would always say. And that's what Jesus always said too. He would heal you from your disease and he would say your sins are forgiven. Now cut it out. That's what he always, we always want to throw that in there too. So our passage begins with Paul stating 
We do all of this stuff. We serve. We VBS if we're going to modernize it. We get together and do Wednesday nights. We show up and, and we're hot in church to worship God. We show up for each other. Why? Because it's not about us. The first thing, the main thing, the most important thing, what are we supposed to look like? We're supposed to look like people who love others. Thus, we come together for others. And so if you like to take notes, I'm going to give you the quick little thing that is the most important thing that I'll say multiple times, and I hope you memorize it, write it down, focus on it, make it your mantra in life, and it's simply this. We gain the most new hope when we give the most. We gain the most in our lives when we give the most to others. We gain the most of anything when we pour our passion and our heart and our desire into it 100%. Can I get amen? Amen. Anybody ever done a job and they gave every single thing they had to it? Next thing you know, they're doing better and better and better. Man, Margie, who watches this, and she's going to be horrified. I just, I'm going to use her as an illustration, but I'm going to use Aunt Margie as an illustration. She was in sales most of her life. And I know she was in furniture sales and for a long time, and she was really, really good at it. And I know this story because she told me about it. One day, she heard her coworkers complaining about her. And they kind of mentioned about how she is just the luckiest salesperson, made another sale. You're just so lucky. And she responded to him, I have found that the harder I work, the luckier I get. It's the same in everything. It's the same in church. The harder we put our heart into loving others, the more they're going to feel like we love them. And the more they feel like we love them, we'll run into a word called authentic. And authentic is how we approach others and authentic is how we impact others and if we do it because we just love them and we want to make their lives better we're going to have a big impact when I was writing things down and trying to answer that question who do we want to attract I said everybody <laughs> I realized we can't attract everybody there's people in New Delhi India I'm never going to meet probably I can't attract every single person So who do we need to attract? Who do we want to attract? Well, one, I want to attract people who have some life experience, right? They've lived life. They've gone to work. They're retired. A lot of them are sitting here in our church. A lot of our church are retired. You've had some life. You've had some experience. You can give some really solid advice, and you also need to know and need to recognize that your life is just beginning. You still have a lot to do, a lot of work, a lot of ministry, a lot of love to give, a lot of people who need to know how to go through what you've been through and need to know how to, to do what you do. And we want to attract those who are in the midst of living right now. What if you're trying to figure out how to be a single parent? and to get kids up and out the door at 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m., and get them to school and get them to work on time and all these things. What if you're trying to figure out how to do all that? You know what? I know how to do that. Some of the others in the pews know how to do that. What if you're trying to figure out how do I, how do I live with kids going off to college and kids going off to work and all that? I bet you some of our people have done that. What if you're trying to figure out how to I, do I work as a husband or a mom and raise kids and two families and two incomes and all that we have people who've done that we want to attract those who have experience and those who need experience and then we finally want to attract those that think they already know it all and don't need experience we call those teenagers and younger when I was a teenager I realized at some point when I grew up that the older I got the smarter my father became it's not, or my mom, it's not that they didn't have knowledge then. I just didn't want to listen to it then. And you know what? When I was really young, it was even worse. And the older I got, the more I realized that, okay, they have some wisdom here. We want the young. We want the not young. We want the in-between. We want to attract all those. Why do we want to attract all of those? That's the question. Why waste their time? New hope tough question right and when I started thinking about this and I'll just admit we were at lunch and I had this question why do we want to attract these people and my my answer my first go-to churchy pastory answer was to win them to Jesus and that is right that is not a bad answer at all 
Except if my whole focus is just to bring this person to Jesus, and I know that there's some big churches in town that have every come-to-Jesus idea you can imagine. They've got it going full-fledged. Then why wouldn't we just take our evangelism budget and put it all printing out flyers, go to this church? They got you covered. Why? Because I think people are different. And I think that there are people who need new hope. And I think there are people who need to come invest in new hope because new hope, new hope needs those people. I think that love is what we offer. And I think experience in certain aspects of life is what we offer. So my question, and I promise not to go too long because it's hot in here. My question for you is how do we love others? How do we do it? How do we show love? Well, the good thing is I don't have to just make this up. I don't have to come with a three or four point sermon that all the words start with the same letter and we can just make it up and feel good about it. But what I can do is look at the Bible and see, did Paul go on to tell us in this passage how he loved them? Obviously, I've already looked ahead, so I know the answer. And the answer is yes, he did. Beginning in verse 8. Beginning in verse 7, I'm sorry. He said, but we proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. As a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. He's talking about sacrificing here. He's talking about love here. He's talking about passion here. The word used here when he's talking about tenderly affection as he's talking about that wholehearted, 100% strong affection. The Greek means strong, wholehearted affection, which means if we halfway engage our community, you know what? They're going to be 0% engaged to us. If we halfway go out there to try to tell a loved one about how much we love them or tell them about Jesus or tell them about about what they need and why they need, and and it's a halfway, we don't really, we're not passionately involved in that, you know, then they're not going to want our advice at all. They're not going to want to know. What if you're driving down the road, and you come across a bridge, and it's going over a river, and that bridge has fallen out, and you're standing on the side of the road, and this car's coming, you're like, hey, you may want to slow down or stop if you feel like it. If I was you, I would stop, but you may want to consider stopping. Is that effective? Is that helpful? I think what's helpful is jumping up and down, waving the bridge is out, right? Being passionate enough to stand in the middle of the road, you got to run me over in order to fall off this bridge. If your heart's desires to fall off the bridge, you got to take me with you. And flashlights and flares and throwing rocks at their windshield, whatever it takes. What Paul is saying is you got to be whatever it takes with people if you want them to know you love them. And you got to be whatever it takes with people if you want them to know that Jesus has changed you. And you got to be whatever it takes to build relationship. Has anybody lived through the last two and a half, three years, or is it just me? Have you noticed? We feel uncomfortable now with relationships. Have you noticed that when somebody comes up and knocks on your door, you stare at the door like, am I going to answer that? You see somebody walking up the driveway, you're like, no, 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 turn around, turn around. I don't want a relationship. We don't say that. But it's what the truth is. I don't want that kind of community. I don't want somebody getting in my bubble. When I was in high school and I took psychology, I took it in college again. I don't think I learned from either of them. But what I did remember is that people have a three-foot bubble, right? Anybody ever hear this? You have a three-foot bubble, and what's most uncomfortable is that person who likes to stand in that three-foot bubble. And, like, somebody stands there, and you step away, and they take a step, and you step away, and you're like, would you please stop stepping in my bubble, right? Like, I have a three-foot thing. Well, now I think because of 2022, it's like 11 or 12 feet. It's like you're close enough way over by that door. Am I just making this up, or do you get what I'm saying? You get it, right? We've gotten to where a relationship is long distance, if anything at all. 
And so if you really want to love someone, it's going to have to be authentic. It's got to be real. It's got to be that, the, what he's saying, that motherly, passionate, strong affection. Where I can't save the whole community, I know that. If we were on the Titanic right now and you had one little canoe, that's great. You can't save all of them with your kayak, right? But you can pick a couple and say, I'm going to get those couple of people. I can get that person if I am consistently loving, authentic. This is who I really am. As Paul said, we didn't come in here lying. We didn't come in here deceiving. We didn't come here telling you it was all frolicking in a field of daisies. We came in here with the truth and with our authentic selves, and you really get to see the imperfections in me, and I really get to see the imperfections in you. That's ministry, folks. That's the gospel, folks. That is Jesus through you loving people, folks. That's what we're supposed to do. He goes on to say in verse 8, For now we really live, that's chapter 3, sorry. In verse 8, he says, Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also of our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden. He goes on to explain how they didn't want money. They worked, and I'll try to wrap up because I know it's hot. He gets into around 12, 11. He says, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. So he said, as a mother, we were 100% affectionate, passionate, all in. He said, what are we all in on, though? Number one, he said, exhorting, exhorting you, exhorting. This word simply means speaking truth. Wholehearted, wholehearted the truth. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to cover it up. I'm not going to make it seem like it's not what it is. And actually what's so interesting about this word, this word means calling someone to oneself. It means I'm going to love you enough to tell you who you really are. Love you enough to call you to who you're supposed to be. It's not that, that my job here is to beat you up and make you feel bad about who you are. It's to tell you who you could be. It's to tell you who you're supposed to be. It's to tell you who you really are. Because who you really are is someone absolutely chosen by the God of the universe. He created you with intent. He said he knows every single hair on your head. He knows every aspect of your future. He knows every choice you could make, and He knows every choice you did make. And if you're sitting right here, even if it's because somebody drug you here, it's not by an accident because He put you in the life of someone who would drag you here because He wanted you here. And if you're watching online, it's not by an accident because He wants you here. And if you live within our radius and you think, maybe I should go visit New Hope, then maybe you should come visit New Hope. Because He wants you here. You have something for us, and we have something for you. It's speaking the truth of who they really are to them and who they were designed to be, and you were designed to be His. I was thinking this morning, I don't know why I do that. When I think, I develop little rabbit trails. But I was thinking this morning, and it's, there's a little bit of a lie from the enemy. And that little bit of a lie, you'll see it on Facebook and stuff where the devil whispered in my ear, you're not strong enough to withstand the storm. And I whispered back, I am the storm or, or however you want to play it. It's these little things. And the truth is, you're not in the fight. And that's where the lie is. The lie is that, you know, we're fighting the devil. We're not in the fight. We're not about the fight. It's not with us against the enemy. The enemy wants to hurt us, wants to harm us, wants to destroy us, wants to do all these things because he's trying to go against God. But the reality is he's not in the fight either because God is the only one in control and God is the only one with any kind of power. God is the only one. 
The enemy may want to get you all wrapped up in things of the enemy, but in reality, Jesus won the victory on the cross 2,000 years ago. The fight is not mine to fight. The battle is not mine to engage in. The battle was already won. The battle no longer exists. You're talking to me, enemy, about a battle that occurred on the cross. It's over. You lost. I have been redeemed. Can I get an amen, church? You have been redeemed as well, right? My sin was paid for 2,000 years ago on the cross of Jesus Christ. You can try to whisper it in my ear. It doesn't matter why. Because victory was gained at the cross. And when he walked out of the tomb, he gave me hope, which is, by the way, the other thing we're supposed to be talking about. He said exhorting. And then he goes on to say encouraging. And by encouragement, he means speaking your story of hope. We and we alone have hope. How many here have lost a loved one? Every single one of us. You don't need to raise your hand. Can I tell you something? You have hope. And the hope is that they are alive and active and happy and busy right now. And later on in Thessalonians, he's going to tell us, he's going to tell us that when Jesus returns, he's bringing them first. We will, if we're alive at the time of the rapture, we will get a new body. We will be called up. All these things will occur, but before all that, them first. Because they're fully alive now. They're fully engaged now. They're fully active now. They're fully in His presence now. They're fully doing things now. Good news. Good news that if you loved someone and they're a believer, you've got this hope of millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years of life with them and with God and with a relationship, and with stories, and with laughter, and with things being fixed, relationship issues broken now, repaired then. Relationship issues hard now, repaired then. You have hope. And you have hope for you in the fact that your sins are covered now. Your sins were paid for by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. You are perfect. You may not feel perfect, but God has declared you perfect. God has said the only way to make him happy is you have to be perfect and you couldn't do it, so I came and did it for you. Ergo, you're perfect because I'm perfect. How many feel perfect today? I'm glad nobody raised their hand. How many know they are perfect because of Jesus Christ today? We can raise our hand on that, right? Amen. Because Jesus is perfect. And Jesus said, you're perfect because I'm perfect. Matter of fact, I'm not just making this up. If you read in... Some further writings of Paul, you will say that God knew, God made him who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, to become sin so that we may become what? The righteousness of God. So he said, I'm taking who is perfect and making him appear imperfect on the cross so that you who are not perfect will appear perfect in my presence because Jesus Christ makes you perfect. Amen? I know it's hot. But the gospel is going out. And the truth of the gospel is worth sweating for. Amen? So he said, tell your hope. And he goes on finally to state. It was exhorting, encouraging, and then finally imploring. This word means testifying. This is like you're in a court of law and I'm telling you, the truth. I am testifying what's occurred. So right here, the hope is that you are going to tell your hope. You're going to tell others, this is what Jesus did for me. This is what Jesus did for me. I can love you the most by telling you the truth of what my life has been and what experiences I have had. I've had hardships. Anybody agree? I've had sorrow. Anybody been there? I've cried. I've wept. I've mourned. I have stomped my feet saying this is unfair. I have sat in a different church on the stage at 1130 at night, and it's empty, nobody there. And I have called out to God, shouting, I did it right. I swear I did it right. Where were you? Anybody else ask the where were you, God? When this pain hit, where were you? How would you let me go through this? I, how are you letting me go through this? Why am I not hearing your voice? Why are you so quiet? I love the little poem about, you know, why did I only see one set of footprints when all the hard times in my life? And the answer is that's when I carried you. And I've sat there going, that's not true. 
because I walked that alone. But now when I look back, I'm like, yeah, he carried me. Some of it, he drugged me kicking and screaming, right? You been there? He drugged me through it all, but he carried me. He had me. He never betrayed me. He walked with me. He didn't take it away, but he loved me through it. I've seen miracles. I've seen heartache. I've seen joy. I've seen sorrow. My hope for you, New Hope, is that you don't deny any of it, but you experience it fully, 100%, because you know what? Other people in your life have seen sorrow. They've seen joy. They've seen victories. They've seen defeat. They've felt. They have experienced. It's real. It's authentic. And the real scary thing is whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not, you're going to win and you're going to lose. You're going to hurt. You're going to have a void if you don't. You're going to try to seek how to fill that void if you don't, and it's going to hurt you. It's going to cause pain. It's going to be hard. It's going to feel great at first and then collapse all around you, right? People know what I'm talking about because they've experienced that as well. But you have a story. And your story is here for those who are on the same path just a little further behind. And maybe you are 20 years into your story and somebody is day two into it. And I'll say, how dare you rob them of not being authentic in their life? How dare you rob them of keeping your story locked behind your doors? Because no, you don't want them to know or because you're not comfortable or because you don't want to get up and go to church on a Sunday morning. What if their one shot was meeting you? Who do we want to attract? People that need us, that we're 100% willing to be all in for. Why do we want to attract them? It can't simply be some neat little phrase. Why do we want to attract them? Because I actually really love them. I actually really see them. I actually really hear them. And I have the courage to be my authentic self. If you're going to half do it, don't do it at all. If you're going to fake it, you'll never make it. Remember, New Hope, we gain the most when we give the most so why should we love as I close luckily I didn't write any more notes on this one other than why should you love you love because he first loved you way back when when you were wicked and evil and sinful it could have been Tuesday could have been yesterday maybe right now way back When you were lost in sin, Jesus determined to go to the cross for you. Knowing your sin, knowing all about, knowing the secrets that nobody but you know, he then said, I'm going to the cross for that person. I am giving my blood because they are worth every drop I've got. I always like the theological argument that If only one person ever committed to Christ, he would have still gone to the cross. Because it's individual. It's personal. I can't get saved for you. I can't even talk you into getting saved. The Holy Spirit calls you. The Holy Spirit tells you to come. And then at that point, it's up to you whether you accept Jesus or not. But the Holy Spirit is the one which is so neat. So God decided to come here for you, and then God did the work for you, and now God's telling you, hey, you need to, you need to accept my free gift. It's Christmas. Open the present or not. That's the option for you. It costs you nothing. It gives you everything. Amen? We gain the most when we give the most. And what we have to give to Jesus is acceptance of his free gift and our faith and our trust. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, may your word go out. May your gospel ring true in our hearts. God, teach us to stop. Just stop. Stop with wearing the mask. Stop with trying to to create a whole big list of things that we all have to follow. Teach us to stop and trust 
trust you, trust you did what you said you were going to do, trust the work of your hand, trust the words that came out of your heart. And then God, teach us to get on board so that we can absolutely love like you loved and like you do love and like you will love tomorrow. Make us a representative and an ambassador of the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you for new hope, God. Send us forth into your field. Send us forth willing to work. Lord Jesus, forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for the times that maybe we didn't trust in you. Forgive us for the times that we did it on our own. Forgive us for the times that we were less than sincere with the price you paid. Instead, Jesus, wash us in your blood. Make us whole. Make us connected with the Father. And teach us, lead us, guide us in the way that you have for us to go. Amen. New Hope, don't forget, Wednesday night we're having a dinner. And then Friday we're having Vacation Bible School. Look forward to seeing you all then.